Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. So in this video, I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, crazy weather, the weather weirding that California has been getting. So it's had about its 12th um, atmospheric river um, in the last little while. So it's had loads of uh, precipitation, rainfall. Um, and then when that water vapor is in the air is pushed up over the Sierra Nevada, it's um, dropping, you know, it's of course depositing snow and it's depositing huge amounts of snow, uh, record amounts of snow in the Sierra Nevada. So if you look at some of the ski resorts, um, you know, the tow, the, those, um, the ski lifts are up on these huge pylons, these poles, and uh, there's actually images in Mammoth and some other places where people are walking on top of the snow and they can just reach out and touch the pulleys on these uh, ski lifts. So huge amounts of snow, uh, you know, over over 700 inches, I believe, in some places. So I'll show you the data on that. I'll show you, uh, I'll talk about atmospheric rivers and what they are and uh, you know, it's all part of weather weirding, if you like, in the climate casino. So there was also a uh, tornado that was spun off one of these atmospheric rivers and it hit um, Montebello. And that's very rare, you know, to have a tornado in California. And that ties into my previous video when I was talking about tornado alley shifting and the nature of tornadoes changing because of abrupt climate system change. So... This is, um, you know, so this is the uh, a, an illustration of an atmospheric river. So it's like a river in the sky. It's it's uh, condensed water vapor flowing in the atmosphere produces huge levels amounts of rain and snow, especially in the western U.S. When these atmospheric rivers move inland and sweep over the mountains, the water vapor rises and cools to create heavy precipitation. So you get rain um, and then you reach the snow line and you get snowfall. Um, many atmospheric rivers are weak systems that simply provide beneficial rain or snow, but some of the larger, more powerful atmospheric rivers can create extreme rainfall and floods capable of disrupting travel, inducing mudslides, causing catastrophic damage to life and property. Okay, so, um, you know, this isn't a new thing, but they seem to be get. we seem to be getting more of them. Uh, you may have heard of the term Pineapple Express, um, and that phenomena is where you get the um, water vapor forming, sort of these things forming near Hawaii in the Pacific and then crossing the Pacific and coming ashore in California. Okay, so the Pineapple Express refers to their origin. They're roughly... Um, 200 and they're, they're approximately 250 to 375 miles wide on average. They move with the weather and are present somewhere on Earth at any given time. Um, and they're, they're, they can stretch for huge distances, thousands of, of miles in, in length. Um, California depends on them about, on average in a year, about 30 to 50 percent of precipitation on the west coast occurs in just a few AR events and contributes to the water supply and flooding risk. So a lot of the reservoirs are replenished from just a few atmospheric river events. So, you know, in California, it either doesn't rain, but when it rains, it pours. If you have one of these atmospheric rivers uh, bringing the water over. A strong atmospheric river transports an amount of water vapor roughly equal to 7.5 to 15 times the average flow of water at the mouth of the Mississippi River. Uh, the Mississippi flow, I believe, is about 30% of that of the Amazon River. I'm just reading a book on the history of water and how water has been so vital for civilizations, and it's actually fascinating stuff. Um, it's, uh, and I'll, you know, I don't have it in the room with me, at the moment, but uh, I'll, I'll show you the cover in another video. Um, so anyway, it's huge water flow. The water vapor is carried and, and condenses, and you can see these ribbons of, of uh, moisture in the air. Um, 
They're a primary feature of the entire global water cycle. I'll show you on Earth Null School, you know, they're, we're, you know we're, how you can see them. They're tied closely to both water supply and flood risks, particularly in the Western US. And uh, we've been doing a lot more research on them recently. So scientists say over the last decade have improved their understanding of the ARs. Um, it used the, you know, it's from based on observations from satellites, radar, aircraft, numerical weather models. More studies are underway. Um, this was it, saying including a 2015 scientific mission that added data from instruments aboard a NOAA ship. And since 2015, we've been looking at them. They've been looked at very, very carefully. There's a snowstorm right now in, in Ottawa, almost into April. Yeah, so, you know, it does happen. So these atmospheric rivers are a very crucial part of the climate system. And uh, there has been periods of history where they have you know, basically hammered California, you know, constantly running over, bringing huge like fire hoses connecting the ocean to the land. And uh, in the late uh, 18, 1860 odd, um, and at some atmospheric rivers filled up the um, filled up huge uh, basins. The California basin was filled with water, essentially. Sacramento was under 15, 20 feet of water. Um, so if an event like that happens, and they're being modeled in some, with something called arc storm, then that would cause catastrophic damage. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that too. Okay, so this is the basic uh, form of the atmospheric rivers. Um, so the tornado, let me talk about the tornado. Since I was talking about all about tornadoes um, in uh, Tornado Alley, how that's shifting in my last video. So Los Angeles was hit by a rare tornado, the strongest one to hit the county since 1983. And there's some images of it. Okay, very, very rare. Um, it hit the city just southeast of Los Angeles. It briefly touched down in an industrial park and warehouse district in the city of Montebello. And it was an EF1 with estimated peak winds of 110 miles per hour. So it's the strongest tornado to hit the LA area since 1983. The, the intense micro cell damaged at least 17 buildings, 11 so severely that the fire department deemed them too dangerous to use, condemned, condemned them. Flying debris, there was flying debris and everything, tweeted one person who shared a video of the storm. The video zooms in on a mass of dark gray clouds consuming the sky and tapering down towards land. Okay, one building's roof collapsed, the power pole was snapped, um, da cars damaged, uprooted, you know, uh, a tree. Okay, so still, you know, compared to, uh, tornadoes in Tornado Alley, it's like, it wouldn't even be mentioned there, but it hit in LA. Tornadoes are rare in California. There's fewer than 10 per year on average, and that's in the whole state, according to NOAA. Most tornadoes in the state are, are small and short-lived. They're commonly referred to as land spouts, similar to a water spout, but over land. Um, these differ from more traditional tornadoes that form from rotating thunderstorms, like those common in the central plains in the southeast. So, um, it, uh, yeah, so there was another weak tornado uh, that hit um, a mobile home park. Those seem to be magnets for tornadoes in Carpinteria, which is a seaside city northwest of L.A., it was an EF zero with winds of 75 miles an hour. Okay, so, so the, um, yeah, this is stuff you see in Ohio, Arkansas, not Montebello, what another witness was heard saying. Okay, the intense weather came as California has been plagued in recent months by at least 12 atmospheric rivers that have brought devastating flooding and hurricane force winds. An atmospheric river is like a fire hose that carries saturated air from the tropics to higher latitudes, dumping relentless rain or snow. Okay, so basically very, very unusual, very weird weather. Thus, I call it, you know, weather weirding. Now, here's another, um, here's another article. 
uh, from the national, you know, um, from, from USA Today, National Weather Service confirms tornado hit Southern California city of Montebello. Um, it hit at 11.20 a.m. Pacific time. Um, and uh, it's definitely not something that's common for the region. Um, it wasn't confirmed as a tornado until 8 p.m. that night. Uh, they're still assessing the, the damage. I mean, they don't have the radar coverage that you would have in, in the Midwest. So they're not, they're not used to seeing these things. So here's uh, the industrial area in Montebello, um, you know, which is sort of in the greater Los Angeles area. Um, here's California. You can see the LA area, this little jutting spit here. And yeah, so this square, this rectangle is enlarged and it hit right over here. Um, lots of tweets of the uh, tornado um, touching down you know, some debris from roofs, et cetera, being picked up, um, right? So, you know, damage assessment. Uh, the last time the LA office sent out a tornado assessment team was in tw was 2016 near Fillmore in Ventura County, when it, where it was determined that a small twister had touched down. Um, debris was spread over a city block, basically. So it came during, um, uh, one of these, um, dur during the, uh, basically during one of these atmospheric river events, which we've had 13 of now, I believe. So you can go get Earth uh, Null School and uh, you can, you can uh, set the, the, the time and date here. So this is uh, March 22nd, 11 a.m. local time. That's when it was reported to have hit. So you can see, I'm looking at mean sea level pressure. You can see the drop here. So I believe, uh, you know, I think it hit more over here. But anyway, um, you can track through, you know, see the progression over time of this thing. Okay, you can look at uh, uh, wind at the surface, right? You could go back and look at the, uh, go back and look at what's going on um, you know, over time and so on. So let's go to the uh, present here. Let's go to now. And, uh, you know, you can see some, this is, so this is now, you can see some of this sort of rotation here, you know, it goes over land, it can spin off these small uh, tornadoes. Um, this is, uh, so I'm on uh, Earth Null School, just Google Earth Null School. Um, I'm looking at the uh, this projection E, okay, as opposed to the normal one that you see, the default. I'm looking at the, the map spread out because you can actually see the um, these sort of um, fingers. We're looking at the air wind at the surface. We're looking at the total precipitable water. Um, and you can see these fingers kind of extending up. Okay, so these are the... Um, these are these are the atmospheric rivers that are going on, okay? Uh, these are the bands where there's lots of moisture. Um, let's just if you click on this again, you can get rid of the menu. So you can see these fingers extending out here. So this guy is going like to New Zealand and over to Australia, and then in the northern hemisphere, you could see them extending up, and you can look at the uh, time. This is the twenty. You know, let's go back uh, a day. Right, so you can see the fingers here extending over. That's probably a weak atmospheric river. You can see how they, I'm going back in time. You can see it curling around here. Okay, um, you can look at uh, the mean sea level pressure. Like I said, uh, the wind speed at the surface, the total precipitable water. Um, this is the uh, total cloud water. It tells you right up here, total cloud water, what it is. And you can see, um, you know, you can go, let's go back a few days uh, to say the uh, 21st or something. And okay. Right, you can see these fingers of, uh, you know, the clouds moving up. 
Okay, so you can see this, these, these sort of, so this is uh, total cloud water. You can see it moving inland, carrying, carrying rain. Okay, so if you want to see, you know, in your region, if an atmospheric river is reported, forecast, you can actually go into Earth Null School and see where it is yourself and how it is and see what, you know, see there's one that's coming up over the coastline. Okay, so you can uh, see for yourself, uh, you know, what's happening with it. Okay, so a little bit more about atmospheric rivers. Relatively narrow bands of moisture. They move precipitation across the Pacific Ocean to the West Coast. They're very key to California's water supply. As I said, they supply 30 to 40% in a given year of water to replenish reservoirs, etc. They're commonly referred to as the Pineapple Express because of their origins in tropical regions, although specifically a lot of the ones that hit the West Coast of the U.S., uh, California, they originate near Hawaii, which is why it's called the Pineapple Express. While atmospheric rivers are necessary to keep California's water reservoirs full, some of them are dangerous because the extreme rainfall and wind can cause catastrophic flooding and damage, landslides, etc. At the extreme end of atmospheric rivers is a phenomenon deemed by the U.S. Geological Survey as arc storm. It's an event that's expected to occur only once every thousand years, but with the potential to dump massive amounts of water and cause widespread flooding. Okay, and this, so this happened in the, what, 1860s? And like I said, ran, you know, it rained in California for the whole month, pretty much. And the central California Valley was filled with water. There was widespread flooding, catastrophic damage, Typical atmospheric rivers are 250 to 375 miles wide. They're present somewhere on the planet at any given time. They can carry equivalent to as much as 15 times the average flow of the Mississippi River. Um, and, uh, you know, there's uh, it often when they happen, there's a lot of runoff and the water just goes back into the ocean. So this is in effect, it's, if you like, it's wasted water. So their efforts need to be underway to sharpen the forecast-based decisions so that unnecessary releases of water can be avoided. Um, current forecasts of atmospheric rivers are reliable out to about five days. So sort of like long-range weather forecasts. This is the image I showed you at the beginning. Um, and there's a group called the Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes. Um, CW3, right, center, W3, three W's, and then E. Part of the Scripps Institute of Oceanography, which is in, you know, uh, and this uh, center is at the forefront of atmospheric river research. And I'll show you some information from them. They launched a new tool in 2020 to do sub-seasonal to seasonal forecasting to better predict the influence atmospheric rivers will have on the Western US. There's a method known as the Forecast Informed Reservoir Operations. They want to use the forecast technology to plan for the arrival so that they can be ready for it, for putting the water, keeping the water in the reservoirs, retaining as much water as possible during the short storm window to use, uh, to, to use later. Um, here's a massive 1986 Northern California flood north of Sacramento, caused by the, a, a levee breaching, uh, I believe from an atmospheric river type event. Okay. Uh, arc storm, just a little bit about arc storm, stands for atmospheric river. K is a thousand, a thousand year storm. So it's a one in every thousand year storm. It's where the acronym comes from. So it's a mega storm. Um, repeated occurrences of atmospheric rivers in a short period of time. Um, so there was a scenario that was done in 2010, an extreme storm devastating California, causing up to 725 billion in losses, mostly due to flooding, affecting a quarter of all California homes. I mean, these things, this would be like a super major ca catastrophe for California. Um, the scenario projects impacts of a storm that would be significantly less intense, 25 days of rain, than the California storms that occurred between December 
1861 and January 1862. There were there was 43 days of rain. This event dumped nearly 10 feet of water, 3,000 millimeters of water in parts of California. And basically, looking at uh, sediment research in the San Francisco Bay Area, Santa Barbara Basin, Sacramento Valley, these mega storms have occurred in the years 212, 440, 603, 1029, 1300, 1418, 1605, um, 1750, 1810, and then most recently was this one, the Great Flood of 1862. It's the largest flood in the recorded history of California, Oregon, and Nevada, inundated the Western US and portions of British Columbia and Mexico. Okay, so there's a picture um, in the image there of Sacramento, which was the, uh, you know, the state, the state capital, you know, people boating in the streets. Okay, so geologic evidence indicates that several of the previous events were more intense than the one in 1861 to 62. You know, so in these years, there were massive atmospheric river events and flooding events deposited a layer of silt in the Santa Barbara Basin more than one inch thick. So by look, by doing coring in the sediment, they can see, and then dating the different layers in the coring, they can see when these events occurred. The largest event was the one in 1604, okay, uh, 1605 rather. It left a layer of silt two inches, five centimeters thick, indicating that this flood was at least 50% more powerful than any of the others recorded. Historically, these events have happened every 200 years, okay? Um, so basically, uh, for Arc Storm 1.0, they simulated two strong, super strong atmospheric rivers, four days apart, one in Northern California, one in Southern California. One of them stalled for an extra day and this is what it would do. The Central Valley would flood 300, so the, the lake would be 300 miles long, 20 miles wide. So it would look like this. This is what California would look like. It would have this mass, these massive lakes appearing. Uh, water depth in feet, 10 to 20 feet in this region around Sacramento. This is uh, three to 10 feet in these regions here and less than three feet in these extensive regions here, also deep up down here. Um, so wind speeds would reach 125 miles per hour. Hundreds of landslides would damage roads, property damage of 300 billion. Demand surge, um, an increase in labor rates and other repair costs after major natural disasters could increase property losses by 20%. Agricultural losses, uh, cost to repair lifelines, roads, rail, etc., drain flooded island, repair damage from landslides could bring the total direct property loss to about 400 billion. You know, power, water, sewage, other lifelines would have damage that could take weeks or months to restore. Up to 1.5 million residents would have to be evacuated in the inland regions. Business interruption, 325 billion. So, so uh, you know, an arc storm scenario projected to cost 750 billion or 1 trillion in 2022 dollars, nearly three times the amount of damage predicted by the next big one, which is the, you know, hypoth which is the next sort of Southern California earthquake. Okay, so arc storm 2.0, they did an update in 2022 um, and uh, the likelihood of the event outlined in the arc storm scenario is now once every 25 to 50 years with projected economic losses of over 1 trillion or more than five times that of Hurricane Katrina. Okay, so just uh, read, <laughs> yeah, I mean, 25 to 50 years is not a long period of time. This is the, this is the period, the return period of these things. This would be a completely catastrophic event and it would, it would put a ding on global food supply. So here they compare the Great Flood of 1862. The annual risk is 1.2 to 1.6%. So it would occur 1.2 to 1.6. That's that's in one year. Okay, so, you know, with a 1 to 2% chance in a year, that's a return period of 50 to 100 years. 
Um, and the, 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 the odds of occurring, um, worst case with RCP 8.5, uh, in 1920, the odds were 0.5 to 0.7 percent. Now they're 1.2 to 1.6 percent, and in and in the future, because of climate change, they're going up to 3.4 to 4.8 percent. That would be 43 plus days of precipitation, 10 feet of rainfall, falling widespread. Arc storm, 2 to 4 percent annual risk. So that's every. Uh, 2% 2, 2 risk would be every 50 years, 4% risk every 25 years. Um, a 25 plus day event of atmospheric rivers would cause you, cost US 1 trillion. That's the 2010 estimate in 2022 dollars. Okay, current flood maps really take recent projections from projects like ArcStorm into account, especially FEMA's maps. Okay, so this would surprise an awful lot of people. Okay, um, okay, so that's, uh, it's very important to sort of pay attention to these and to consider these things when you're, you know, if you're thinking of moving. Climate change, this is an article, and I talked about atmospheric rivers in some recent videos. If you just Google, go to my um, YouTube site and just uh, search for uh, atmospheric rivers. I did a series of videos uh, previously on this paper, in fact, this very paper, I believe. Um, you know, and basically California faces a broadly underappreciated risk of severe floods. So they looked at the plausible worst case scenario um, and they found they, they used the community earth system model, large ensemble, cool collection of models, Climate change has already doubled the likelihood of an event capable of producing catastrophic flooding. Larger future increases are likely due to continued warming. Runoff in the future extreme storm scenario is 200 to 400% greater than historical values in the Sierra Nevada because of the increased precipitation rates and decreased snow fraction. Not this year. Okay, so California is very accustomed to water scarcity, but not overabundance. Okay, so it talks about the, the droughts recently. It talks about the great flood of 1861 to 62, and then estimated costs and likelihoods. And the, you know, it shows you, uh, so this is sea surface temperature. Um, this is uh, what it's going to be like, uh, soon and you can see these uh integrated vapor transport kilograms per meter per second massive amounts of vapor transporting across there's hawaii here transporting across from hawaii or originating around the hawaii region transporting across carrying huge amounts of water vapor okay um causing these sort of events this is some examples of uh, precipitation associated with these megastorm scenarios, cumulative 30-day precipitation. You know, we're talking about, about huge amounts of precipitation. You know, if you look at the snowpack in the Sierra Nevada, you can see, you know, it's, it's all piling up there because of these atmospheric rivers. Here's some more uh, data, 30-day uh, snow water equivalent in millimeters, you know, right, depositing loads of snow up in the Sierra Nevada, right, and there's statistics and stuff. Anyway, I covered this whole paper, I believe, in detail in a previous video, so I'm not going to dwell on it um, too much right now. I want to show you uh, some information from the Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes. So this is an update. Um, um, from March 24th, um, and basically this is a forecast of, of what's been happening, uh, you know, this week. So, so this is a forecast from, I guess, uh, Saturday, um, maybe before then, Friday, I don't know, the 24th, five days ago, today's, today's, uh, Wednesday. Okay. So I guess, uh, Friday or Saturday last week and they forecast a fast moving atmospheric river, um, rapidly intensifying surface low pressure off the US West Coast, making landfall in California 
on Monday. They give the integrated vapor transport amount and how long it lasts and you know how much rain there's supposed to be, three to four inches of rain, um, how much snow, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Storm severity index, right? And then there's, you know, areas of where it's supposed to be hitting, maximum forecast scale. So AR1 in these regions. So there's a scale for atmospheric rivers, up nothing AR5, but there's some blue, so blues and some some light green, so AR1, AR2. So generally, you know, AR1. And then, you know, how these whispers are supposed to affect the coast. So this is Monday, Tuesday, uh, Tuesday morning, Tuesday evening. And you can see how the, how the storm is supposed to progress. Okay, and this is from two different models, the European model, the North American model, you know, very similar uh, forecasts. Okay, and the amount of precipitation, cumulative uh, precip precipitation and storm severity probabilities. And there's lots of information. And this is from the Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes. So let's go to that uh, center. So this is Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes. It's, it's part of Scripps. And you can see the different images. So it forecasts information on Reservoirs, reservoir levels. This is uh, the atmospheric river scale. So there's a new scale here. It depends. This is the atmospheric river intensity in this maximum IVT, integrated vapor transport. It's in units of kilograms of water vapor per meter per second as it's moving. And then you have the duration, 0, 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours. And uh, here's the scale, you know, AR1 to 2 up to 5. 5 is mostly hazardous. So 5 is huge vapor transport and it lasts for, uh, you know, 2 to 3 days or even longer. Okay, so then it falls under AR5. The 4s are here, 3s, 2s, and 1s, etc. So this is an atmospheric river scale. The atmospheric river scale is based on duration and maximum intensity IVT at a specific location. So it communicates the, the potential benefits and hazards associated with these atmospheric rivers. So you can see, you know, this type of thing. So this would be all of the red area, um, you know, and you can see how it weakens as you go out. So, so this is very interesting. You know, this is analogous to the, the uh, Fujita, enhanced Fujita scale for tornadoes or the uh, you know category scale for uh, for hurricanes, tropical storms, okay. Um, atmospheric river reconnaissance. They send out planes to measure data in the atmospheric rivers, um, especially the large ones, to try to forecast you know how serious uh, they're going to be. So this is one February first to the second of 2019. Fairly strong. Um, fairly strong one here. This is the integrate, the, the IVT, I believe here, kilograms per meters per second. Uh, greater than seven inches of rain, greater than five inches of rain up here, and so on. Okay, so, so lots of interesting information here. This is showing you an atmospheric river. This is a perfect view. So you can see it coming here and coming over the land. Um, so they produce on average 25 to 50%, it says, of annual precipitation in key areas of the Western US. Okay, they produce much of the snowpack and water supply of California. So this is 24th of September, 2020 satellite images. And uh, this shows you some, uh, where, where the rain's falling, where the hazards are, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so there's there, there's various fork various things you can click on to get more details. But this is a great site. This is the the go-to site for atmospheric rivers that are hitting the uh, the the west coast of the USA. Um, there we can look at some other. Uh, here's some more information on you know the vision of the site and what they want to do. It's fairly new. Okay, so. So uh, 
what else do I have here? Um, they released the new scale to characterize the strength and impacts of the atmospheric rivers only in February of 2019. So similar to scales gauging hurricane, wind, or tornado intensity. Okay. Um, and uh, so basically, the, here, here's the, uh, you know, you've seen this image, but this is how the scale is going to, you know, AR cat 5, AR cat 1, and uh, the effects and so on. Uh, you know, 80% of levee breaches in California's Central Valley are associated with landfalling atmospheric rivers. They're the source of most of the West Coast's heaviest rains and floods, main contributor to water supply. So they assigned the five categories to it. The scale was developed by, the, by F. Martin Ralph, the director of the Center for Western Water and Weather Extremes at CW3E, this organization. Okay. Um, you know, it gives examples and uh, tells you, you know, that it's a weak, moderate, strong, extreme, and exceptional. So here's one, uh, December 29th, 1996 to January 2nd, 1997. Atmospheric river lasted over 100 hours at the central California coast. The precipitation and runoff caused more than 1 billion in damages. This is 100 hours. Imagine this going for... 35 days or 43 days, et cetera, et cetera, right? So you can see, uh, you know, these things need to be looked at carefully and assessed in our, especially in our, in light of our changing climate. Um, here's some more uh, information, uh, deterministic model forecasts in different regions and so on. So, so here's some more, this is more, more, more data Okay, so there's a lot of stuff here. You know, it talks about the integrated water vapor transport, relative humidity. Um, you know, you can get current present data on what's going on. I mean, not, not too much is happening today right now with these things. So I won't go and click on these things. Um, but there's loads of, uh, loads, loads of data here on the, uh, the AR, you know, the atmospheric rivers. So this is, this is the go-to place. Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes. Now, uh, of course, if you go to Twitter and you want to see what's going on, um, this is uh, the place to go. So looking at hashtag atmospheric river, what do we see? Uh, this is uh, heavy snow from yet another atmospheric river near Donner Pass in California. Um, right? Just massive amounts of snow. You know, hopefully this stuff, uh, say atmospheric river one more time, you know, you get in trouble here. <laughs> That's uh, uh, two layer lake historic flooding. See the before and after extent of water as of March 28, 2023. Okay, so the water has to go somewhere. If the water melts really quickly, you know, with the type of snow depths in the Sierra Nevada, there's going to be huge problems, huge landslides, huge, huge, huge flooding, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, is this the latest? That's, maybe it's not. Yeah, I guess it is. Okay, so it, it's... Uh, so you can get a good overview for, you know, what's going on. Uh, Twitter, I think, is the most useful um, way to just scroll through quickly and get. We're in the midst of another bomb cyclone in the Bay Area, March 28th, which was yesterday. All right, lots of different people post, lots of scientists. You can get the latest here as opposed to the top. Um, saturated fields. Oh, this is a map from 1830. It shows a 300 mile lake sitting in the middle of California. So here we go. Lake in the middle of California. Wow. 
Okay, so there's still lots of weather, weather weirding, if you like. Um, 